Morning, everyone. Good to be back here. Uh, and as I uh, said last evening uh, at the dinner, uh, the OGTC conference is uh, a good fixture on the annual calendar uh, for the simple reason that the mix of people uh, who are involved in it, the kind of uh, subjects that we talk about, are uh, probably far more rooted in reality than many other conferences uh, and probably cover a much more holistic picture of the industry uh, than in many other fora. Why I mention those two is because uh, in conferences when we stand on the stage we can look further ahead and we kind of uh, tend to talk about things which are far in the future, uh, tending sometimes to lose uh, contact with the reality. Uh, somebody agrees with me in, uh, in the audience already. Fantastic. Uh, and the other thing is uh, that uh, when we are dealing uh, with the industry, we tend to forget how interconnected it is. We tend to look at uh, different parts. So in India particularly, we have this thing of, you know, we have the yarn sector in which we'll have the cotton yarn sector, we'll have the uh, polyester uh, guys, we'll have uh, fabric uh, weaving companies who will be split with the mills and the power looms and so on and so forth. And there are so many subsectors in this industry. We tend to lose sight of the whole picture. Uh, what I thought I'd do for uh, today's presentation is actually uh, uh, perhaps start with an overview of the apparel uh, sector as it is around the world. But just before I do that, for some people who are in the audience who don't know about uh, Third Eye Site, we are a management consulting firm uh, specializing in the consumer products ecosystem. We work with the fashion sector. We also work with uh, other products. And we work with retailers, brands, and their supply chain, and also investors. Uh, in business strategy and operations improvement. So let's start with a number. It's a very nice round number and it's got uh, a very large implication for us today. The global export trade in textiles and apparel is estimated to be $700 billion. Now that's a significant number. It's actually a humongous number. This number has come to this point with significant shift in how people trade across the world. So there are today uh, countries on the list of exporters which didn't exist on that list even 10 years ago. Uh, there are countries with market shares in the global trade which just look, you know, and if you look at China's market share, it just looks uh, as if it's been there forever. And that's, that's not really true, but these are some important factors. Uh, how things have changed in the last few years is the initial trade which started back in the 50s, uh, uh, 60s, it started growing further, was built on lower cost. Partially also it was built uh, as a reconstruction effort of the world economy after the World War uh, to start uh, to help uh, some of the countries which were ravaged by the war. Uh, including Japan and then later on uh, further in, into East Asia, uh, some of the European countries as well, where buyers were encouraged to look at these economies as low-cost economies and source from them. Uh, that gave way in the last 15, 20 years to China. And, and, and there's, there's no other way. I mean, it, it just gave way, we all gave way to China, uh, which was driven by three things. Firstly, government policy in China to encourage labor-intensive industries like apparel, but also other products. Humongous amounts of investment in infrastructure, and you know, we can, we've been uh, talking about the excessive amount of investment in infrastructure that China has undertaken. But the fact is that that infrastructure is playing its role in helping uh, the growth of exports and manufacturing in China. And the third is the huge, huge pool of labor. With these three advantages, China has literally taken over as uh, the world's factory. So if you look at uh, what's happened in the recent years, uh, the global trade in uh, apparel specifically, uh, you see China as that big block at the bottom. And actually, there's one small block underneath, uh, which is India. Uh, and that's the difference between India and China. Then you have uh, other countries, Bangladesh, Turkey, etc. Uh, if you notice, uh, it's, it's not 
very, very discernible. So I'll just move on to the next slide, which will probably make it a little more discernible. Uh, China's maintained roughly a 40% uh, share of the market in the last four or five years. And that's saying something. You know, uh, The economy has shifted. The eco various economies have gone through a lot of turmoil, uh, especially in the 2008 to 2010, 2011 uh, period. And yet, China has maintained that share. The interesting thing, of course, is there are other countries who have expanded share, and one of them is India, very marginally, uh, still in the overall context, but it has expanded its share of global apparel exports. But there's another interesting thing. It's not just about low labor. So if you notice the other countries on that list of top 10, there are countries which, by no stretch of imagination, can be called low labor cost countries and they are still on the list. So there's clearly other forces apart from labor and apart from just sheer infrastructure or government policy at play. Specifically when we come to India's textile and apparel exports, uh, this has been the picture. So, you know, looks like a reasonable growth in very difficult times, uh, 18 and a half, roughly 18 and a half billion dollars to about 25 and a half billion dollars. But the important thing is when we put it in the context of uh, targets, we're quite a way off from there. So this is the target actually for this financial year, 41, 40.5 billion dollars. And we are well short of that. There must be a reason why. We can keep blaming the world economy for it, or we can keep blaming uh, uh, compliance factors, or we can keep blaming many other factors. Uh, but there is a huge gap, and that huge gap uh, if it can only be explained by external factors, uh, we would be fine. But the fact is, there is a gap between our vision and what our reality is for the simple reason that when we've set out the vision, there have been gaps in our planning and in, in our execution and in our, just in the framework that we have in mind uh, to get to that target, to get to the objective. I think there's also a gap in what our customers want and what we are giving them. What do our customers want? Let's, let's start with the most obvious, and I think uh, uh, we've discussed this earlier as well, and it still remains a factor. Our customers, when we look at the world market in textiles, when we look at what the, the demand is like versus what our supply pattern is like, there's a very clear di distinction, a very clear difference uh, in terms of the fiber mix. Uh, sure, we are, a, uh, we are one of the largest producers of cotton and therefore it's one of our natural strengths and so on and so forth, but that really does not address the issue that if you want to be among the gl leading global exporters of textile and apparel products, your supply must somewhere reflect what the demand is. It has to. Either we shape demand or we fit into demand, and in this case I would say we need to fit into demand. So there needs to be a significant, significant investment in areas apart from cotton. When we look at, uh, when we work with retailers particularly, but also uh, other buyers who source uh, out of different markets, uh, including India, uh, what's going on through their mind? And, you know, some of the things that have really uh, kind of taken forefront uh, in a buyer's mind or in a buying team's mind when they're looking at sourcing. In times like these, the first thing which comes up is, should we consolidate our sourcing, source from fewer countries and fewer suppliers so that we can manage them better? Or should we, on the other hand, diversify our risk and start actually looking at other suppliers? And it's, it's actually uh, not one or the other, neither is the right answer. This is a question, it's a debate which goes on season after season in buyer's minds. The second one which has happened more recently, I think, and we've been talking about it for the last, I think, six, seven years, but I think it's just taken uh, 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 a momentum of its own in the last two, three years particularly, is should we place more product closer to our market, which would be a reversal from our globalization in a sense, or should we go with uh, actually just uh, looking at placing product outside in uh, other supply bases and so on and so forth? 
The third one is, uh, should we deal with things strategically? And the other side of the brain would say, you know, strategy doesn't really matter. Nobody could have predicted 2008. No, nobody could have predicted uh, the currency crisis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There, there'll be enough reasons uh, for somebody to say, it's actually better to react to what's happening in the market rather than be strategic. Consultants love this word strategy, but does it really work? Yeah. And the fourth thing, which is a constant battle, is should we go for the lowest cost? We are, after all, chasing margins, and you know the customer is looking for value now. People, uh, there are countries, there are economies where uh, people under 25 are in unemployed to the extent of 25 to 50 percent uh, unemployment in under 25s in Europe, uh, in some of the countries. So, in that kind of an economy, do people really want fashion? Do they really want to be in fashion, or do they just want the lowest cost product? And retailers have. Uh, this debate going on constantly in their mind. What I would say at this point is that actually it's all of these. There will be retailers, there will be buyers who will be taking one side of the debate versus the other, but there's no guarantee they'll stick with that the next season. Because the thought process changes with the real experience of how the season is shaping up. And that's going to impact the next season's buy, the next year's buy. The one big thing, the one big thing I think most retailers uh, are more and more concerned about is this, not to put all your eggs in one basket. And there are only two baskets on this slide, but there could be many more. And I think as suppliers, we need to be aware of this, because there is opportunity in this. Where there is risk for the buyer, there's opportunity for the supplier. If we can actually diversify, help the, help the buyer diversify the risk, there is opportunity, there's business to be had. One of the biggest risks, and I can tell you this from countless conversations with buyers that we've worked with, retailers that we've worked with uh, in Europe, in the US, uh, con you know, conversations going back to the mid-90s, early 90s. We are overexposed to China. This is a statement which is not recent. It's, I've heard this so many times. And that still remains. You know, China has actually gone from uh, some low double digits in, in uh, the late 90s to about 40 percent of uh, the world market today, of a much larger world market today. But there is opportunity in that because people are still thinking about this. The way buyers are actually uh, addressing, the, these are the three things they have to juggle actually. If you really think about uh, being a buyer, we, we tend not to think like a buyer, but I think it's, uh, it's very important. It's, it's at least once a year, if not twice, thrice a year, if not once a month. Uh, this exercise is a must for a supplier. How do buyers think? So they th they're thinking about efficiency, definitely. But they're also thinking about the risk, and they're also thinking about innovation. As suppliers, we need to be aware of where our strengths are. It's very difficult for us to address all of these three, if not impossible. Very, very few suppliers can actually address uh, efficiency and innovation together. You know, efficient innovation is something which uh, very few people have discovered in this world. But if you can be strong on at least one, and preferably two of these characteristics, then you have a business going forward. Why? Because there are very different, uh, different approaches. You know, when you're talking about efficiency, you're talking about predictable products. You're talking about forecast accuracy, which is much higher. You're talking about essentially the focus being on reducing the cost of the product, reducing the cost of transportation. On the other hand, when you're talking about unpredictable products, that, that's where you know, the fashion element comes in, the, the innovation comes in. The focus is much more on uh, having not, not so much accuracy, but having the product in time for the fashion window that exists in the market. So when you, when you Take it from the supplier's point of view, for the efficient products, for the basic products, if you like, for the risk-free products, the need is to be in stock and the focus is on replenishment. And you can then build your systems as a factory, as a supplier, you can build your systems accordingly. On the other hand, when you take the other side, it's about catching the trend. 
Now, this is something which, again, you know, uh, I think uh, has been pointed out earlier as well. In Delhi, NCR, we are actually good at on, on this side of the table. We're actually good at identifying what the trend is earlier than some of the other guys. We are good at actually feeding some of the ideas, and I think that's that's something which has been a focus. I would say we need to take a step further forward. We're still going from, you know, on the one side, taking orders and uh, producing them most efficiently, supplying them most efficiently to, let's say, reacting to the trend quickly and being a product development partner to the buyer. I think we need to go, actually, a step further. If we need to be a preferred supplier, then we need to actually set the trend. We need to be able to do what the buyer is not able to do or what it costs the buyer much more than it would cost us physically to actually set the trend, to actually feed ideas into the development process far earlier, preferably, and there are some suppliers in, in the country who do that, uh, to actually produce product which the buyer wants, no changes or minimal changes, and that's your product. And then you're actually not reacting to any trend. You've already figured out, because you've been so involved, deeply involved in the product development itself, you're very clear about what the costs are. You're very clear about how to efficiently get it there. Uh, the window of opportunity is actually being set by you, so you don't have to meet somebody else's external standard. And I think that's a huge, huge competitive advantage in today's world, because today's world is about unpredictability. And if you can introduce predictability in your business in some form, this is the best way to do it. On the market side, this is about defining value, really. Product development value, uh, I would say starting from design value or product value. It's your product, to being a product development partner, to being uh, an efficient supplier. These are three tiers, uh, and I would prefer most suppliers in Delhi and CR would take the first or the second tier rather than the third tier, because the third tier is actually quite competitive. I mentioned the word here, calling uh, branding, and you know, you may be justified in asking. I'm a factory. I'm a contract manufacturer. Where does branding come in for me? If you sit on the other side of the world, and if you're making a buying plan, that buying plan is broken down under supplier names. Where do those supplier names come from? Who decides that? Why do they decide that those supplier names need to be on the list and not? 20,000 other supplier names who exist around the world. That's branding. It's not about just being a consumer brand. It's actually being a brand in your buyer's mind. And I think that's something which is important to remember as well. And if we can't start that now, we would have missed the boat because there is an opportunity to start that if you haven't already started that, to be a valuable supplier, top of the mind supplier in your buyer's mind. So. The key points, really, uh, as far as Delhi NCR is concerned, are these three. Uh, first thing to remember is that the global apparel trade is not just about cost. Cost is one of the factors. Low cost is one of the factors. Buyers can make margin better if they have better product which they can sell at full price. That's better delivered through design. That's better delivered through timely deliveries. It's not the best delivered by having the lowest cost two weeks after the season is over. The second is that there is growth available. Clearly, there's growth available. So let's, you know, that's the good news of the day. If I might call it that. Uh, there is growth in the market. We don't need to be all glum in this room. And that will come if we actually creatively destroy our businesses. You know, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Indian philosophy, there's a pantheon of creation, sustenance, and destruction. But the destruction at the end is not a destruction forever. It's actually about creating something new. That's the cycle. And we need to undertake that cycle ourselves in our business to creatively destroy what exists so that something else, something new, something better can take its place. What we do need to do while we are thinking about this is we need to make it easy for buyers to do business with us. So we, we've, you know, when buyers approach India, uh, Many buyers who've stuck with India for a long time actually love India, I think, for some reason, some previous karmic reason or whatever it might be. There are so many hurdles. 
even in terms of our supplier relationships, there are so many hurdles. We make it difficult. There are enough difficulties in our ecosystem as it is. We don't need to make it difficult for the buyer to buy from us. Let's make it easy for them. The second one is under-promise and over-deliver. And I know I'm preaching to the converted or the choir here because OGTC members, I think, have a much higher awareness of uh, this factor, how to actually under-promise and over-deliver. I think a lot of the ecosystem needs to absorb that in Delhi NCR. Because, uh, and I can tell you this, you know, uh, just a personal anecdote. I was uh, meeting a client uh, in uh, Chennai. And he said, do you have an office in Chennai or in uh, Bangalore? So I said, no, we, we're based in Delhi, but we work with clients uh, all around the country and all around the world, in fact. So that's never been a problem. His notes, not that. It's just that uh, actually, you know, uh, I mean, we have built a trust, but uh, people in the South tend to be wary of people from Delhi. You know, there's a cultural disconnect, which uh, they seem to come across as uh, insincere, and uh, sometimes you're not quite clear whether you'll get what uh, you've been promised. And that's the image of Delhi, unfortunately, in the country. Uh, but uh, we know that there's no smoke without fire, so there must have been uh, something somebody must have done to that gentleman or somebody who known to him, uh, and he must have been bitten uh, quite badly. But that's, that's something which we are living with. I mean, that's, that's in the environment uh, that we're living in, that we're working in. So we need to change that, and the best way to change that is actually to, within our own transactions, under-promise and over-deliver. Uh, I've said this uh, enough. I think flexibility in value addition. And basically, it's about being valuable. It's not about value addition through embroidery or sequins or uh, you know, some design change or whatever. It's about being valuable. You have to be, as suppliers, the one that the buyer thinks about when they're thinking about a new product. And I think that's a situation, that's, that's a position which is far more competitively sustainable than anything else. If a buyer is stuck to you, if a buyer believes in you, if a buyer uh, really, really wants you as a supplier, uh, you know, it's not going to be about the five cents or 10 cents or whatever. It's really about knowing that you can season after season, month after month, deliver the value that the buyer is looking for. Help them deliver their performance. And that's what matters, really. I'll skip this, actually, except for one fact. Uh, we, we know that there's a lot of gap in infrastructure. But I think it's, it's needed for us to come together as an industry and to talk to the governments. And NCR, of course, includes four state governments, and possibly five if you talk about Rajasthan as well. So Rajasthan, uh, Delhi, Haryana, and UP. There are four state governments involved. Uh, but surely there is a need to have large, good convention and trade show centers. I think the ones which are there uh, have, uh, uh, have not really uh, fulfilled their purpose entirely. And I think the industry is uh, spread out wide enough to be able to accommodate uh, world-class convention centers. And I think that's needed because uh, buyers come to a place not just uh, looking at factories, they need a place to congregate. You need to have a place where suppliers can congregate as well, uh, more than once a year. Uh, there are places in China where you can actually walk into a building and you can uh, come out of the building uh, five days later having met all your buying budgets. Uh, there isn't a building like that in India. Uh, nowhere. Not in Delhi, NCR, nowhere else. And I think that, that's something to really think about. More importantly, I think there is that need to build that soft infrastructure. And I think OGTC itself has a huge, huge role to play in that. They've been doing that uh, as a cluster uh, for a long time. Really building the linkages within the industry. Like I said, it's not about being piecemeal. It's not about being one company or the other. It's about actually creating that infrastructure, uh, soft infrastructure, the environment in which uh, we all uh, benefit. We all have a role to play in actually upgrading it, but we all benefit. It's uh, research, design companies, uh, and individuals who are actually providing the inputs. It's about translating that input into saleable product. It's about having the infrastructure on IT to have transparency and communication, which is real uh, and real time rather than imagined real time. And 
a need for capability. I think we talk a lot about training. Uh, there's a lot being done in the name of training, which is not really sticky training. I think there's a lot of skill and capacity development that still needs to be done. Uh, the biggest one, the biggest change would be orientation of everybody in the industry to customers and markets. I think that's a huge, huge one, which is missing at the moment. Uh, what about domestic? I think a lot of people in this room who are actually, uh, who've dealt with the export sector for maybe 15, 20, 30 years, uh, now see this consumption boom in the country, and we are all part of that as well. So how about feeding into this? How, how about riding on this? If you are thinking about it, uh, I think we need to be clear that there's a very different mindset. And I can tell you this, that if you actually uh, are already on the way to understanding your customers' needs uh, in exports, you're better suited to actually targeting the domestic market. But you do need, as a company, you need very different mindsets, very different teams of people, perhaps, uh, very different uh, processes, systems, because products, apart from the product differences between the global and the Indian markets, uh, buyers are different. You may be accustomed to working with the best buyers who are a few hundred million dollars or maybe a, billion, a few billion dollars in turnover. In India, the best buyers are perhaps, uh, if you break down uh, you know, uh, Future Group's business or if you take Shopper Stop or whatever, a few hundred crores. It's not large. And when you start breaking that down into further products uh, and departments, you're dealing with a buyer who behaves possibly uh, in the same way, in the same obnoxious way as a buyer in the US or Europe would behave with you with a much smaller wallet to spend out of. And then you really think, as a business owner, is it really worth it? Is it really worth my time? So it, if you're really interested in the domestic sector, I think it takes a lot of investment. It will play out in the next uh, few years, a few decades. Uh, as somebody else from outside, uh, one of the European brands that we worked with said, India is one of those markets that we can start, we can launch a brand today and that brand can actually live out its life cycle over the next few decades. That's the market we're living in. So it's worth investing in. If you're really serious about it, uh, you, know, you can start seeding it now and it can grow. So one last thing. Uh, fashion is about desire, right? Uh, when I look at the people that we're able to attract in the industry, we as an industry today, the apparel industry, particularly the textile and apparel industry, uh, the question mark really is, are we attracting the best talent? The youth today have far more choice in terms of careers than they ever had. Despite the fact that NIFT today has 15 centers and Pearl Academy of Fashion has some three or four centers and there are many other schools around the country, there are lots of students coming out. Are they really sticking in the industry? There are many more students coming out, graduating out of these institutes, but are they really staying with the industry? Are the best ones staying in the industry? Are the best ones even applying to these schools? I think it's a, it's a big concern, at least it is for me. I mean, I, I'm an alumnus of the first batch of NIFT, and uh, somebody, one of the other guys, that one of my former colleagues actually in a previous company, uh, said this to me, why are you wasting your time with garments? This was 12 years ago. That's, if that's the attitude people who worked in the industry are going to have, uh, it's going to be very hard to attract talent because we need to make it seem worth their while, that this is an industry which is growing, this is an industry which is, uh, you know, creative, it's, it's uh, full of potential, etc., etc. What does a young person look for when they come out of uh, an institute? They're looking for inspiration. They're looking to be inspired. And I think that's really uh, something which we need to, uh, we really need to think are we a desirable business for the best people to join? So the last thought uh, is, uh, you know, when I, when I want uh, to feel young, I stand up and talk at a conference which is on retail, because I've been working with modern retail for the last 22 years. Uh, but most of the people in a retail conference in India have spent maybe 5, 10 years in the retail business. So I feel very old, actually, uh, in that. When I want to feel young, actually, I... I uh, speak at a textile and apparel conference because there are actually more people in the textile apparel conference who have spent maybe twice the amount of time that I've spent with the industry. Uh, so there's a lot of 
experience that's already there. Bruce mentioned this morning uh, before this session started that uh, uh, what he remember uh, remembers of you know whatever he knew about the uh, industry 20 years ago is completely irrelevant uh, today. And I think that's a very valid point. But the fact is that there is experience, there's experiential knowledge which exists in this industry, in this room, which we can tap into. And as long as we can add that inspiration to it, as long as we can make the industry desirable, we will have that young talent, we will have the young energy also coming on board. And I think that's... Uh, that's